Hey there everyone, today we're going to be looking at Maurizio Lazzarato's Capital Hates Everyone, Fascism or Revolution. This work stands as a general anti-capitalist polemic, aiming at discovering the inherent fact of destabilization in the form of war and general violence in the circulation of global capital. And Lazzarato is going to look at neoliberalism and how it is played out in places like Brazil, for example, in order to chart out the future of what it looks like to oppose capital and how capitalism thrives on things like racism and sexism. We're just going to be looking here at the first chapter titled, When Capital Goes to War. And on page 25 of said chapter, he writes, But one shouldn't make the mistake of separating a violent South from a pacified North. It's the same capital, the same power, the same war. The neoliberals, guided by a class hatred, lacking in their adversaries, made no mistake by mobilizing in Latin America. Not only because capitalism is immediately a world market, but also because the revolution which, for the first time in history, revealed itself to be global, had its most active centers in the South. It had to be crushed as a preliminary to all governmentality, even if this meant allying with, hence legitimating, fascists, torturers, and criminals. And this is in the part of the work where he's looking at the way that various Western powers have helped uphold, like Pinochet, for example, in Chile, and also Bolsonaro in Brazil, and he's looking at the ways in which these neo-fascist regimes actually thrive off of the sort of revolutionary fervor that was present in Latin America. He writes that without civil war and fascism, without creative destruction, there's no conversion of the economic, juridical, state, and governmental apparatuses, dispositifs. And one of the central themes in this work is that war, and particularly civil war, which is to say war within the quote-unquote, you know, civilized world, within the metropoles, that this is one of the key ways that capital functions today. Because Lazzarato looks at the various triumphs of global capital, of the sort of rise of globalized markets, of world integration, of, oh, we triumphed over communism, for example, looking at these triumphs over the quote-unquote subaltern classes and seeing how this triumph, after those more overt triumphs, become integrated into the very fabric of society. And one of the ways that Lazzarato looks at this is the creditor-debtor relationship. So credit and debt get established such that people enter into a, a sort of war of all against all with debt and credit. It's an entirely made-up value, even, even more so than regular money, quote-unquote, which is still a sort of made-up value. But he writes here on page 31, access to credit, whose goal was to reduce poverty, also functioned as the Trojan horse by which financialization was introduced into the everyday life of millions of Brazilians, especially the poorest, quote-unquote, inclusion through finance. The creditor-debtor relation is a technique making it possible to guide and control behaviors across the social groups, since it functions as well with the poor person as with the unemployed, the wage earner, the retiree. And this is one of the interesting things that I think he's pulling from Deleuze and Guattari, although not primarily Deleuze and Guattari, is there's a sort of radical flattening of ontology that occurs by capital, where, you know, Marx talks about capital basically thriving on surpassing its own limits, and Deleuze and Guattari developed that in Anti-Oedipus. Laterato is looking at that, and he's saying, well, okay, what does that mean for when our lives start to get governed by capitalism? Well, it means that we start to go against ourselves, namely, vis a debtor, And we're sort of in debt to ourselves and, of course, are forced into positions of work that are maybe not 
optimal per se. And as such, there's a focus on integration, which we hear a lot in neoliberal discourse. He says that this is an attempt to resolve the crisis using the techniques that produced it. So there's an advocacy for including people into, you know, during the colonial era, era this was the civilized world, integrating the uncivilized nations into the civilized ones, and now this is integrating people into the workforce. And Foucault even points this out when talking about prisons, that it's equally a question of discipline just for the sake of discipline as it is discipline for the sake of reintegrating people and reformulating their identities in the form of someone who works. That what defines you normatively in society is the ability to work and to be productive. And this is the inclusion through financialization that Lazzarato speaks of, that people become financialized in their subjectivity, such that they're basically a mobile form of currency and capital. He writes on page 33 that the new policies of social protection are a radical break from the principles of the post-war welfare state since they aim to protect the basic means of subsistence while encouraging risk-taking by the individual. They pressure the poor to transform their behavior so as to be capable of individually taking on the risks that indebtedness involves. And this is another big theme that Lazzarato talks about in this work, is that this financialization of the individual through being included in the metropoles and the expansion of cities and infrastructure, this means that each person, of course, takes on the risks that usually would need to go to just a few select individuals. So the capitalist, for example, needs to incur very little risk, whereas the people who actually produce Because they're in a situation where, for example, jobs are very scarce, where there's high unemployment, those are the people who are taking on the risk because, well, you can just fire them and get someone else because there's a high demand for the jobs. But because there's that high rate of unemployment, there's also the risk of, you know, the conditions that you'll face if you're unemployed. So by creating these artificial, stringent circumstances of high unemployment, this is actually profitable for capitalism because it encourages risk-taking. It encourages people becoming hyper-productive in order to survive, right, so that they can keep means of subsistence, such that they will actually take on the risk of what it means to be indebted, namely, you know, indebted to work, for example. He continues, the social risks that had been assumed collectively, first by workers' risk-sharing, then by the welfare state, must now be taken on by the individual. Welfare, though it's a means of controlling workers by nationalizing the modes of mutual solidarity, did preserve the principle of the socialization of risks. This covering over of social risks by the individual risk of indebtedness is conceived by the financial institutions as a technique of subjugation, the regular repayments imposing a discipline on the borrowers, a form of life, a way of thinking and acting. In the view of the World Bank, such a self-control is essential for transforming the poor individual into an entrepreneur who can manage the irregularity of his income flow thanks to credit. So, of course, we all know the risks that credit involves, namely the ones that we saw reified in the 2008 financial crisis. And this inherent irregularity, which of course was not the fault of individual debtors so much as these you know, people in high-ranking positions in business that were actually making these shady deals that people didn't really know about, This social risk gets put onto the majority of normal debtors such that it becomes a defining part of their subjectivity to engage in a sort of self-control, which is a, a very patronizing way of putting this. It's a very liberal way of saying, oh, you know, you just need to 
be more self-controlled when it comes to keeping your job. Like, obviously, it's not that simple. And that's what Lazzarato is pointing out, is that it's not merely a question of self-control, but that's how, you know, management of your life in tough circumstances is put in sort of neoliberal ways in order to convince you that you're not in a state that is like actively against your well-being. One of the ways that the neoliberal world order is kept is through welfare programs. We saw this with like the New Deal, for example, here in America. And Lazzarato actually wants to point out some of the perniciousness of welfare programs, not in a reactionary sort of right-wing way of, oh, people don't deserve to be helped. No, he says here on page 35, those who don't keep up with the pace of competition, those who fall outside the labor market, have available a minimum with which to start over and re-enter the competition of all against all, work fair. Moreover, it's the state itself which must work towards this transformation by underfinancing the services, by allowing them to degrade, and by putting in place fiscal policies that encourage the recourse to credit. And we see this with ghettoization, for example, where property values in an area that often features minorities is purposely undervalued such that people in these situations will start to go to credit because, you know, it's so easy to get a credit card. And in this situation, people are forcibly underprivileged, you know, whether this is also through the incursion of lots of police presence, such that one is forced to reintegrate into society and given a minimum, namely credit, which defines their subjectivity as thereafter a debtor, effectively putting them back into circulation, forcing one to work in an order, of course, that you know they didn't really decide. Now, one of the big things that Lazzarato is trying to go against is this notion of just reducing capital to economy. It's way more than that. Of course, it's political economy, which means that this is going to actually influence people's lives in a political way, in a material way. And he says here on page 49, capital is not just economy, but also power, political project, strategy of political confrontations, the sworn enemy of political revolutions carried out by its slaves. Workers, poor people, women, colonized subjects. Contrary to another received idea, capital is not cosmopolitan, and its deterritorialization, its indifference to territories and to its boundaries, is entirely relative. Its objective is to develop the productive forces, but solely on the condition that they can produce profit. They condition, Marx laid it out clearly, is in an obvious contradiction with the development in itself of science, labor, technology, etc. Profit requires that the re-territorialization that ensures its existence be realized through the nation-state, racism, sexism, and, if need be, war and the fascisms, the only thing capable of politically ensuring the continuation of exploitation and spoliation when the situation toughens. It is naive to think that subordination of the productive forces to profit is purely imminent to the functioning of the economy, law, and technology. Without the state, without war, without racism, without fascism, no profits. The triumph over the subaltern classes was not produced once and for all. It must be continually repeated, reproduced. And this is an important element we see of for example, colonialism in the 19th and 20th centuries, is that it thrives on the creation of conflict and continually stretching out conflict. For example, the incitement of Arab revolts against the Ottoman Empire by the British and the French. I think of the McMahon Hussein correspondence, where Arab revolts were actively encouraged with the Sharif of Mecca against the Ottoman Empire on behalf of the British. And this is not just some, like Lazzarato is saying, this is not just some minor part 
of the way that capital runs. No, it's a necessary part of capital's growth that it needs to grow, that it needs to deterritorialize, which is to say it needs to, it needs to lose its territory, it needs to become indifferent to its territory to an extent, it needs to globalize, it needs to integrate more, it needs to diversify, that's a common word we hear in economics and finance, and in order to do this, it needs to re-territorialize in a way that requires the nation-state, that requires racism, that requires sexism, that requires violence and war, and destabilization in order to set into effect conflicts, such as we see in the Middle East today, that can be beneficial to Western powers, for example. Lazzarato writes, Capitalism is ruled since the conquest of the Americas by a global governance whose main task is the production and reproduction of the division between the populations of the metropole and those of the colonies. The economy world has been structured on the basis of the racial division that has spread over the planet while serving a function that is political and economic at the same time. And this split that he speaks of, of course, gets reified in the modern age with the sort of global north and global south divide. And during the Cold War, it was the, you know, it was split by the Iron Curtain between the East, governed by the USSR, and the West by the US. And this bifurcation, and it doesn't necessarily need to be dual, it can, you know, it can be multipolar, this is necessary to the functioning of capital. It allows for there to be an enemy, for there to be a scapegoat that can be targeted. But one of the key things that Lazzarato points out is that he wants to bring this analysis into the 21st century. He says, because of its collapse, capital was obliged to change its strategy and transform the separation between populations of the North and the South into a competition between all the populations of the planet. Globalization is this strategic act of placing labor power in competition on a global scale, right? This is basic neoliberal, like, we need to let the competitive forces of the market drive the integration of the world into a global state of uh, kind of mutual toleration, I guess. And Lazzarato wants to point out that that toleration is built on the back of violence and that globalization actuates competition between everyone. It's a losing game for basically everyone except a, a few number of elites who get to skate away relatively unscathed. He says globalization consisted in transferring to the West the heterogeneity of enslavements and dominations that characterized production in the colonies, commanded and controlled by the superior power of finance, rather than a generalization of wage earning, as Marx envisaged it. The structuring of our societies resembles the colonial reality in a formal sense. And this is a final quote, protean, unbalanced, where slavery, serfdom, barter, handicrafts, and stock market operations coexist. And if you have any doubt of this, just think of the fact of outsourcing of labor to third world countries. Nike can have factories in Burma or, you know, in, in Myanmar, I guess now. And by doing this, you can surpass all sorts of labor laws and kind of go into sketchy territory where it's kind of slavery, it's kind of not. I mean, it kind of feels like the, the legal gymnastics of like Guantanamo Bay or something of, well, it's kind of our territory, it's kind of not, it's kind of international law, it's kind of not. And of course, everyone knows about bad sweatshop conditions, but this is a critical part of the expansion of capital is you exploit people as much as you can, which means creating spheres of exploited persons, not just exploited, you know, not just extracting surplus value from commodities, no, extracting exploitative conditions and engendering exploitative conditions into people themselves. Such that it's not simply a generalization of wage labor, 
But specifically, it is a generalization of enslavement and domination, the likes of which we saw in Western colonialism. So it's not just this benign question of finance. No, it is the active facilitation of violence. And we see this in all sorts of ways in the rhetoric of these kind of, you can't really tell if you can call them fascist or not, people like Trump, for example, where Lazzarato writes here on page 55, the object of hatred and rejection has changed, but the same mechanism remains at work. The migrants, the immigrants, the Muslims, etc., are stealing our jobs, our women, they're invading our territories. This is like American southern border rhetoric 101. The fear of being robbed, fear in general, that powerful effect constitutive of European politics from its beginnings defines the racist. This is a Sartre quote. It's a man who is afraid. Not of the Jews, certainly, of himself, of his consciousness, of his freedom, of his instincts, of his responsibilities, of solitude, of change, of society, and of the world, of everything but Jews. Millions of non-owners and petty proprietors who see the real possibility of losing the little they have due to follies of the stock market find the material and spiritual property and the phantasmal affirmation of the nation and the identity of the supreme people. And this is remnants of colonial rhetoric, sort of recycled into new tools of national identity and belonging. Nationalism has still retained some of the themes since National Socialism. Now it's not the Jews, but it's the Muslims, it's the Mexicans, it's the immigrants in general, it's Indian immigrants, it's, you know, whatever it may be. The tactics are remaining the same, and it's, it's astounding to me that we're not able to see this with a very clear head. One of the important elements that Lazzarato looks at is the nationalization, the globalization of capital and what this means. What this means, not simply in an abstract sense, but throughout this, how it impacts people's lives. Lazzarato writes on page 64, production came out of the total wars, radically different from how Marx had defined it, as did the subjects of revolution. It became a part of circulation in several ways. Starting in the Cold War, it was no longer more than a moment of the circulation of commodities, logistics, and with the rise of neoliberalism, a moment of the circulation of money, finance, and the circulation of information, mass media, and digital industries. More generally, as the feminist theories have suggested, production is now just one part of social reproduction. It is subordinate to the possibility and the ability to reproduce and control the whole set of dominations and the strategic confrontations that characterize them. And strategic confrontation is a theme that he's going to develop throughout this, which almost has a militaristic sort of language, the likes of which Virilio talks about in Speed in Politics, this sort of circulatory global network, where, as Lazzarato is pointing out, Production is only a mere moment in a state of global circulation. Production is meaningless, just like, you know, slapping a Nike logo on a t-shirt made in a sweatshop in Myanmar. It means nothing if it's not integrated into a global circulatory network. And we can see that what defines the biggest accidents in Virilio's sense of the accident in global markets is not the places of production. The places of production are rather expendable. There's so many people in poor circumstances that are willing to produce. What really causes the most upsets is canals falling, bridges falling, shipping boats getting stuck in the Suez Canal. It's transportation and circulation logistical measures that when they get interrupted, cause the most catastrophic things to happen. And that's something that I think a lot of economists are not really privy to, or, you know, they're obviously privy to it, but not really thinking about how that influences human subjectivity, how that influences what it means to be productive and what the future of productivity means, which, of course, as he pointed out, is equally a sense of social 
reproduction in the form of, you know, this is incentivized by the media, by Instagram, by things like this. And he continues, already at the end of the 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s, capitalists viewed production in terms of the interconnection between production, distribution, and consumption on the scale of the world market. The capitalists think of value and calculate valorization on the basis of the total cost of these different integrated flows of circulation and production. Thanks to logistics, the factory is fragmented, spread, stretched between the different territories of the planet, so that a single commodity incorporates a multiplicity of parts from all over the globe. While Marx made the factory the motor and the beginning of the value chain, commodities today are manufactured across logistic space rather than in a single space. So, right, transnational capital complicates the notion of production since it's no longer an industrial center that is the heart of production. No, it's diffused throughout a chain of circulation. And this chain is very strategic because, I mean, sure, you have a bunch of links in a chain, but if all the links are the same, you can just replace them for one another. As he says, production for the war had no limits since it merged with the activity of the nation and its space merged with the planet as a whole. So the entire planet becomes a stage for war, for exploitation, for integration of the entirety of society. And it sort of takes on a recolonizing of the entire world through finance, through debt, through the proliferation of capital. And the reason this work is called Capital Hates Everyone is because the existence of capitalism for Laterato is fundamentally an assault on everyone. It is an assault on producers, on workers, on humans in general, particularly because, like we've emphasized so far, it requires the incentivization of violence, of real violence, not just, quote-unquote, like economic or social violence. No, like people being in sweatshops, people being dispossessed. As he writes on page 76, in contemporary capitalism, war is always at bottom a civil war a war against the population. Capital's war, unlike the war waged by the state, does not have as its basis and objective the affirmation and extension of sovereignty, but the submission of humans and non-humans to the production of value. It's only under the political hegemony of capital that the global civil war is prioritized over the war between states. Lazzarato's thoughts remind me of Virilio's when he's talking about total war, when he's talking about this state of constant habitable circulation, everyone turned into a vehicle, shuttled across you know, temporal boundaries that previously couldn't be passed. Lazzarato states, The transformation of global civil war into biopolitics, war within the population, turns the latter into a war without the enemy, since the enemy has disappeared with the revolution. With the dissolution of class into the category of population, what power sees everywhere, less as revolution than as danger, risk, source of chaos, is the terrorist, quote-unquote. Since this war coincides with control of the population, it has neither a beginning nor an end. Similarly, it foresees neither a victory nor a defeat, since the force relations are asymmetrically established and stabilized for the sake of capital. There is no enemy to be defeated, only losers to be governed, and terrorists to be neutralized. At the same time, the loser can become a political enemy, provided the subordination to biopolitics and governmentality is transformed into a strategic confrontation. On this unstable ground, security techniques intervene with a view to anticipating what can't be anticipated, the event of rupture, and their interventions proliferate precisely because of that impossibility. 
And we see this with the fact that anyone can be can become a scapegoat. George Soros can become a scapegoat. Nancy Pelosi can become a scapegoat. Mike Pence can become a scapegoat. Anybody is susceptible to, of course, all sorts of conspiracy theories, which are not actually working for the benefit of the populace, of what supposed populism is about. But in fact, it's for benefits programs that support and help the rich at the expense of everybody else. Laterato takes a lot of emphasis and a lot of inspiration from this quote by Walter Benjamin, who says that the power that guarantees a legal contract is in turn of violent origin, even if violence is not introduced into the contract itself. When the consciousness of the latent violence in a legal institution disappears, the institution falls into decay. So violence is a necessary corollary to quote-unquote peaceful circulation of capital. And this is something even Hobbes knew about. For him, the basis of the enforcement of contracts was the idea of an overarching coercive force, which for him was God. The idea of God as the ultimate lawmaker and the one that is imposing the reason why you won't violate a contract. And he goes against Foucault a bit because he thinks that Foucault is a bit extreme when it comes to his conception of power because, of course, for Foucault, traditionally we see, for example, with discipline that it's seen as something negative, something that takes away from someone's identity. But, for example, in Discipline and Punish, Foucault shows how disciplinary measures can actually serve to produce subjectivities and thus the birth of biopolitics, of the working on bodies, of the creation of docile bodies, which is a great theory, by the way. But Lazzarato is going to contend with Foucault a little bit here because Foucault makes biopolitics, as he says, an apparatus centered on the augmentation of life and the power of populations, a control technique that has lost any negative character, violence, repression, war, to define itself as a positive force of production of subjects, freedom, and security. And of course, this is a, you know, this is a contention with Foucault and kind of discourse analysis in general, is if everything is defined discursively, if everything is imposed, if subjectivity is imposed, then it seems like we're almost sort of valorizing power itself because power runs the world in a very uh, sort of Nietzschean sense. But Lazzarato wants to bring back into this equation the fact that no, power is not just constitutive. And look, Foucault wasn't unaware of the fact that, you know, people get, for example, in like penitentiaries, they get physically hurt and things like this. And if they don't get reintegrated into society, they get, you know, they get beat down by the system in a very real manner. But it's certainly a worthwhile contention against Foucault to insist on power acting hand in hand, still with negative measures, still with active oppression. He writes here on page 83, the insistence with which Foucault defines the techniques of power as being productive, while putting us on guard against any conception of repressive, destructive, warlike power, doesn't correspond in any way to the experience we have of neoliberalism. The fact is, especially since the end of the last century, that war, the fascisms, racism, sexism, nationalism, and neoliberal reforms have demonstrated the negative, repressive, and destructive nature of power. So, right, just keeping in mind that, yes, power is destructive and it requires the actual institution of violence. He writes, capital is not production without also being at the same time destruction, destruction of persons, things, and life forms. If one stops the analysis at action upon an action, one will thus have a modernizing and limited conception of power in capitalism, since its existence and its reproduction also presuppose class, racial, and sexual violences. That's important. That capital, 
requires destabilized states of flow to already exist that it can integrate. He continues, These relations, which pertain just as much to the nature of capitalism, do not belong to a past destined to disappear with the full development of capitalist techniques of power. In order to function, the latter need violence upon things and persons. So once again, the incentivization of violence is a basic functioning of capitalism. He writes here on page 88, The apparatuses that depersonalize power relations, money, wages, etc., cannot function without personal relations of power. The Marxian fetishism, relations of power between men turn into relations of power between things, is a source of misunderstandings since a flow of war, without a flow of racist, sexist, nationalist violence, the abstract and impersonal flows of money, law, etc. would have no chance of being operational. So the very existence of, for example, the value of money depends on whatever authority says that this money is worth such and such, that you have a reason to believe them, that you have a reason to come into a contract, so to speak. And as Benjamin said, that requires the existence and the conscious awareness of violence that acts as a continual process of destroying and producing persons and laws, too, through this sort of kind of halfway point of the state as something that incentivizes this, but of course is acting on behalf of capital. And that's one of Lazzarato's biggest points, is that capital has the agency here, not the state anymore. Now, Lazzarato has some contentions with Foucault again, where he's talking about biopolitics, and he's saying that, for example, biopolitics is not necessarily biological in basis. Things like race are contingent historical developments that, of course, were formulated by people trying to subjugate those who were different. And he writes that today, race doesn't exist biologically, genetically, but it persists as a technique of division, segregation, inferiorization. Racism without race continues to produce its political, warlike, and military effects. He continues that conflicts will be dominated by war in the midst of populations, the populations having become both actors and strategic stakes. The target is much less the state than the population, and winning the war means controlling the environment where the populations live. And this is the key part. The population, the object of biopolitics, is not understood from the biological or racial viewpoint, but in its political, social, and historical dimension. Biopolitics, properly so called, is subordinated to war, and civil war constitutes its truth. The enemy thus reverts to being what he always was, a political enemy, even when he expressed his hostility in racial terms. So right, the the sort of anti immigrant talk, yeah, it's it's put in racial terms or in xenophobic terms, but in fact, it doesn't really have to do with race. It's just this fundamental need for a scapegoat. He writes, The life that is at stake is not primarily the biological life of the population, but the political life of the capitalist machine and the elites that are its subjectification. So capital is at the heart of this, once again, acting as the agent by which these injustices take place. He writes on page 107, the French president Emmanuel Macron defines this logic very well. It is necessary to, quote-unquote, aid the wealthy so that they produce the wealth that will trickle down to the bottom and instill responsibility in the poor, make them feel guilty while impoverishing them. And that's the key part. The, the guilty are the poor and the poor are the guilty that you are meant to feel as if you are guilty because of your debt that you are forced into. I think of student loans, for example, which is something very pertinent to um, all young people's situation like me. And as such, this very sense of impoverishment, which one did not decide 
there's so much going into one's social situation that decides the state of poverty, such that one is forced, just like, for example, the black person in Fanon's writing, is forced into a state of guilt against themselves because of conditions that they didn't decide. And one of the big contentions that Lazzarato tries to bring out is that, as he says here on page 112, I'll just read it, politics, law, the state, the political system, don't replace war. Politics and war are always strategies, quick to morph into one another, but under the hegemony of the machine of capital. While the two strategies are at the service of power, of capital's machine, they can also be mobilized by revolution. They seem more suited to political activity than simply to performative or discursive action, which can certainly form part of a political strategy, but providing they don't reduce the latter to performance and discourse. So right, he's going against the performativity of someone like Butler, the, at least the pure performativity of someone like Butler, or the pure discursivity of someone like Foucault or Said and stressing the importance of the war machine of capital. And, you know, that's an idea, of course, being taken from Deleuze and Guattari. And I think it's actually a really useful one, because Deleuze and Guattari make clear that the war machine isn't necessarily a question of war in the traditional sense. It's just a, um, it's a much more general term than that for something that incites deterritorialization, and that can be you know, that can be a helpful deterritorialization, something like the schizophrenic in Deleuze and Guattari's work, or that can be the negative version of that deterritorialization, and it can serve something like capital. It can serve to incite the despotic signifier, for example, that being capital. And he doesn't want to reduce the agency that is violence of the war machine to something discursive. It actually has effects on people. As he concludes, combat is not limited to a politics of recognition of the diversity of human subjects, Butler, but goes to the root of things. According to a logic that fits squarely in the revolutionary tradition, the capitalist heterosexual norm can only be destroyed. One can free oneself and free even the boss of his alienation only by destroying the power relation of which the boss and the worker are the expression. And there we have our kind of revolutionary background that's going to lead us into the next few chapters of this book. So I hope this has been helpful for understanding this work. A very interesting one to read because contrary to like, for example, The Invisible Committee that I think sometimes speaks in very general, kind of semi-utopian ways about what it means to be revolutionary. Lazzarato really understands the state of the modern world. He really puts it in a way that's relatable, where, you know, I'm seeing all this stuff about, for example, prisons in the U.S., and I'm like, oh yeah, for sure, that... Sounds exactly what we're living through today. So Lazzarato has a very keen analysis of what's going on today. And I hope that it's been somewhat useful and that you might consider reading the work because it's fairly short but fairly insightful. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, postcolonial studies, German idealism, gender theory, and other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one.